this list and this genealogy of uh, these men, of the of those that came from Noah. Please help us tonight to learn from this. Please still pastor with your spirit, and we'll go away blessed by this we know. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, Genesis chapter 10. There's a couple famous things here, like uh, uh, Peleg, uh, for in his days was the earth divided. We have Nimrod, which really we're going to deal with Nimrod in the next chapter as we get into chapter 11 and Babel and everything that happens there. Uh, as you can tell, we're really going to focus on the sons of Japheth tonight. We'll be dealing with Magog, uh, especially as this name, this title has become more and more popular here recently as there is a war in Russia and Ukraine and although they're uh, closely related, they're against each other right now and um, there is a war mentioned in the Bible where Magog invades Israel. And so many people are looking on the horizon saying, is this the sign? Is this coming? And we're going to deal with Magog tonight, but also, also we're going to deal with the Ajak Nazis as well. A couple of in the line of Japheth of the names that we read here. There's not enough time to cover everybody, so we're going to focus on Japheth. Uh, we'll deal with Shem and Ham as we move forward in the future. A um, couple things I'll just tell you quickly. There's three common views about when the War of Magog happens. One is here, the other is here, and the final is here. And we're going to get more into that, but first I want to lay a foundation as we build up to that verse and have a better understanding. If you would look at verse number 1, uh, Genesis chapter 10, verse number 1, it says, Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and unto them were sons born after the flood. Now look at the last verse, go to verse 32. Let's take all this in context. Verse 32, Genesis 10, verse 32. These are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nations, and by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. Go back to verse 1. So what are we looking at here? These are the list of the peoples and how all the nations spread apart and how God uh, separated people and began to have distinct races, if you will. The Bible doesn't use that word. There's only the human race, but there's separate families or tribes or nations, and God does separate for a reason. But it's important to understand that racism is a wicked sin. There's no biblical support for being a racist. Acts 17, 26, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth. We all bleed red. God made us all. Hey, we all have a common ancestor. We have Adam. We have Noah as a common ancestor. These three sons, Ham, Sham, and Japheth, were brothers. Now, their wives obviously had somewhat of a different uh, genealogy. Sometimes the pigment of your skin can change based on where you live. Um, the, some argue the squint of your face may be, you know, the, by the sunlight or the angle you look. There's all these debates about how we've changed over time. The most important thing is to understand that God wants all to be saved. He died for the sins of the whole world. He died for everybody. And we should not judge somebody based on their lineage or by their appearance. Now with this, also because we have the tribes of Shem became the Semites, we get our facts at, and we'll have uh, down through the lines, we'll have Abraham, David, Jesus, etc. Uh, it's important also not to be a racist on the other side and say, well, the Jews are better than the, the people of Ham or of Cush or Canaan. We, we should not allow that. I've seen that in some churches, and it is wrong. He died for the sins of the whole world, and our attitude is we love them enough to preach the gospel to them, even if they're different than us, and that is our job as a Christian. Now, he deals with this with the three sons. Again, look at verse number one. He says, now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, every time you see these three brothers, they're listed in this order. Shem first, Ham second, Japheth the third. Now, I've uh, there was a joke I heard years ago, and I've repeated it a few times. It's not entirely true, but I'll tell it just for the sake of a better understanding. Uh, three guys walked into the ark. An olive-skinned guy, a black guy, and a white guy. You say, well, now why do you say that? What, what does that make sense? We have the table of nations here, and we see that different genealogies come from them. Generally speaking, those from Japheth 
are Caucasian, which from the Caucasus, or they're white, generally speaking. Ham, generally speaking, is darker or black. And you know, there are many, even from them, you have the Caucasians mixing with the Hamites, and that's where probably a lot of the Eastern Asians came from, from the, from the intermingling of different genes. Uh, and But you have Shem, which would be those primarily in the Middle East, where Israel, the 12 tribes, they came from this as well. However, the Israelites were not always strictly from that same line. In fact, the majority of them throughout biblical history are intermingled, and especially today, those that call themselves Israelites or Jews are from a different line. And it's important because, again, God's not a racist. But I, I raise the question, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, why does God put it in this order? There are a lot of theories, and I don't know, so I'm not going to speculate too far there. Shem perhaps first because there would be more of a righteous seed. This would be part of the seed of the woman that is preserved, that the Messiah would come through. That's my guess for why it's first. But why Ham next if Ham was cursed and why Japheth last? Uh, you know, he's, uh, he's uh, a border extended. He's growing constantly. He was a larger of the three. I do want you to understand the ages. The Bible does tell us the eldest, eldest is Japheth. If you look at verse 21, Genesis 10, verse 21, unto Shem also the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth the elder. So who's the oldest? Japheth. Well, who's next? How do we know? I tell you, if you go back one page, Genesis 9, 24, it says, and Noah awake from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. So Ham is the youngest that puts Shem as the middle child. Who's a middle child in here? Who's a middle child? You're the middle child? Oh, it all makes sense now, of course. All right, I'm a middle child. I have a middle child. For now, we have another. We'll see soon. Anyway, she may always be a middle child. So there's a joke about middle children, how they're special in certain ways, and, you know... Um, Shem, nonetheless, is the middle child. Forgive me, my throat's bothering me here. Let's continue in Genesis 10, verse number 2. The sons of Japheth, Gomer, and Magog, and Madai, and Javan, and Tubal, and Meshech, and Tiraz. Verse 3. And the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, and Riphath, and Togmara. Now, before I get into Magog, I want to deal with this first. I want to deal with what it says in verse 3. Ashkenaz. Ashkenaz is mentioned a few places in the Bible. It's also mentioned in 1 Chronicles 1, where you have a restating of a lot of these genealogies. Also in Jeremiah 51. Uh, the Ashken Ashkenaz people, Ashkenazim, Ashkenazis, generally are Slavic or Turkish peoples. And I want to read this for you. This is from Encyclopedia Britannica, from Britannica.com. Ashkenazi, plural, Ashkenazim, from Hebrew, Ashkenab, they think Germany, members of the Jews who lived in the Rhineland Valley and in the neighboring France before their migration eastward to Slavic lands, in other words, Pola, Lithuania, Russia, after the Crusades, 11th through 13th century, and their descendants. And this is where the origin of Yiddish comes from. You say, why does this matter? Why are you telling us this? Ashkenaz comes from Japheth. But today, the majority of the Jews in the world are Ashkenazi Jews. They actually come not from the line of Shem, they come from the line of Japheth. And it's sort of an oxymoron uh, to say an Ashkenazi Jew, it's as if you're saying a non-Semite Shemite. It's kind of a contradiction, but yet uh, the religion of Judaism is what is most prominent among banking, and Hollywood and the music industry and we know there's been a movement to repopulate the Middle East the land that was once called Israel to again call it Israel many Bibles that show a map where it calls it Palestine now the newer Bible since 1948 they've changed that where it is calling it the land of Israel again and I bring all this up because it's going to cause confusion especially in the end times as we get toward the end times the last seven years before the millennium we're going to have a false Christ, a false Messiah. He will be part of a false religion. There will be a, a, a false monetary system, a false one world government. All these things will be set up 
And that is what the devil is working for. I believe all the false Bibles point toward that. Why else do they change Lucifer and confuse and try to confuse Lucifer and Jesus with being the same? And there are certain doctrines that are being attacked because I believe they're working toward this Antichrist. Um, and there's a, there are several famous of these Gentile, Japheth line, Ashkenazi religious Jews. Let me name a few. Uh, Albert Einstein, Carl Sagan, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. There's actually three uh, 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 Supreme Court leaders that were, are. Ariel Sharon, Benjamin Netanyahu. Almost all of the prime ministers from the beginning have been Ashkenazis. Natalie Portman, Gene Simmons, Noam Chomsky, and there's many others. I just give a few names that you may recognize. These people are put up as, well, I'm Israel, I'm Jew, but yet really they come from the line of Japheth. Now, there was in history a Khazarian conversion in the 8th century to rabbinic Judaism. Khazars also mentioned in the Bible, and we see it in Hollywood, and now they're populating the mountains of Israel today. They're beginning to regather. So you have a bunch of people from a different line that are claiming to be something that they're not really. And uh, many of the Khazars, they actually come from the Turkish, Europeans, Russia, southern Ukraine, Crimea, uh, uh, Kaz uh, Kazakhstan, and a few others. Now, I say all that to say this, because I want you to understand what we're, what we're dealing with. When we're looking here in Genesis 10 at the table of nations, most of these nations can be documented through time with the support of the Bible and also secular history. We know where most of these nations are today. Many people, because of what's going on with R Russia, well, that's Magog. Magog is Russia. Russia's at war again, you know, because we went through this, you know, a few decades ago. When Russia was at war, everybody was, you know, uh, clanging their shield with their sword, saying, hey, this is it. The Antichrist could come or Jesus could come back at any moment. Many people look for these things as signs. If you would, while you're still in Genesis 10, look at verse number 5. I want you to see this. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, everyone after his tongue, after their families, in their nations. The isles of the Gentiles, we're dealing with a lot of uh, Indo-Europe and Asia, Turkey, Russia, the White Caucasus, uh, the Aryans. A lot of these peoples come from the line of Japheth that we were just given here in the Bible. That is their origin. Uh, the sons of Japheth today, you could say most of white Americans can point their lineage back to Japheth. Greece, the Romans, the French, Italians, Scythians, which in a lot of ways became what we call Russia today, the Slavs, the Russians, Bulgarians, Bohemians, the Poles, Slavics, Croatians, Medes, Persians, Iran, Afghans, Kurds, Germans, Scandinavian, Anglo-Saxon, and Celtic. So if you're generally speaking a white person, then you probably came from Japheth and so it's important to understand this distinction. So again, back at verse number two, he says, the sons of Japheth, Gomer and Magog. Now this is the first mention of Magog. And I wanna take the, the remaining of the time for tonight and talk about what Magog is, uh, when is Magog, or who is Magog? And oftentimes people will say, well, who is Magog? Or, or, or when is it? And there's some confusion about that. Magog is mentioned in the Bible five times. Now the phrase Gog is mentioned a few more times than that, but Magog specifically is mentioned five times. And I have seen some well-intending people try to say, well, Magog is mentioned after the millennium, therefore Russia has nothing to do with what happens at Armageddon. Those are different. Or it has nothing to do with any other wars. And I just want to show you from the Bible what is Magog? Who is it? When does it happen? Because there are multiple events that deal with Magog. And it is not prudent to take one event and discredit another because it has a, same, a similar same reference to a similar people group. Um, after the millennium, there's going to be, or near at the end of the millennium, if you will, things will be drastically different on the face of the earth after the Lord changes everything and changes all the nations and we rule and reign with him. And it uses that phrase of Magog so it cannot entirely be the same Magog that we see all the way back here in the beginning in Genesis chapter 10 after the flood. So consider that. We're dealing with over here, uh, Genesis chapter 10. And uh, you know, if you will, new heaven and new earth is past the chart this way. So I put this chart up here just to try to help a little bit. Um, we have these five mentions. The first is what we're seeing here 
in Genesis 10. The second mention is in 1 Chronicles chapter 1, where it relines all of the nations, almost a parallel to Genesis 10. We're not going to go there, but that is the second mention. The third and fourth mentions of Magog are in the book of Ezekiel. And that's where I want to spend some time tonight. And it's in Ezekiel 38 and 39. But if you would, go to Ezekiel 36, please. The fifth mention is after the millennium in Revelation 20. The Bible reads, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out and deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, to the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. So after the thousand years, Gog does have a reference here before the new heaven and the new earth. We're not dealing with that event. We're going to deal with the event that we find in Ezekiel. Now, Ezekiel is an awesome book. It's very, very deep and very detailed. There are many things that happen that are that happen immediately as it's stated, and then other things that happen later. Uh, most prophecy, most of your major prophets especially, you'll have dual fulfillment, something that was said that took place in that prophet's lifetime to the people that heard it, and then something else that has an application to those that are in the latter days, in the last days. Some even have a triple fulfillment where there are things that uh, happened that was said immediately, that happened at the coming of the Lord, and yet there are things yet to be fulfilled that also point back to that. So, keeping all of that in mind, Ezekiel is uh, a deep book, but you're in, let me catch up with you in Ezekiel chapter 36. I want you to see this first of all. As we get near the end, Ezekiel 33 famously is to the watchmen. 34 goes on and it's to the shepherds. Then he begins to pronounce judgment against Mount Seir, which is Edom. Then he goes into uh, pronouncing judgment against Israel. Uh, in 35, verse 36 is interesting. You're in that chapter 36 rather. Look at verse number one. Ezekiel 36, Also thou, son of man, prophesy unto the mountains of Israel, and say, Ye mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, because the enemy hath said against you, Aha! Even the ancient high places are ours in possession. Now, here he is not preaching to the people of Israel. He's preaching to the mountains of Israel. And the enemy has possession of the high places. Think about that. The enemy has the possession of the land of Israel. And I believe that's what's happening today. I don't believe these are true Hebrews. There may be some. I don't believe that it's the 12 tribes restored. How can we tell? There's The bloodline has been dispersed and intermingled. Uh, if you would, go to Romans chapter 9, please. Go to Romans chapter number 9. The enemies of the 12 tribes are in possession of the land today. And there's no more pure blood. There is no such thing as a pure breed or pure blood. We all started from Adam. That spread out. And then God picked one lineage, and that was Noah, of Noah's three sons. It has since again completely spread out. Uh, to, to, I mean, we couldn't even draw the family tree. The branches come back in together and branch back out again. It's so unique how God has made the human DNA and the reproduction process. But it's important to understand that at the end times, there will be an antichrist, and he's going to be a fake Israelite, claiming, first he'll claim to be the king of the Jews. Then, ultimately... He will claim to be God himself. And that is part of what happens during the time of tribulation. We see that in Revelation 6 and Matthew 24. That is three and a half years of the tribulation. Christians will be here for this event, before the resurrection, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and are gathering together unto him. You're in Romans chapter 9. I want you to understand that there are those that say they are Jews that are not. In fact, um, Revelation 2, he says, I know the blasphemy of them that say they are Jews, but are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. They literally have a different religion. They have a satanic religion. They say that they're the people of God, but really they're the people of the devil. This is happening today in the region called Israel, in the mountains of Israel. And if, if, it ha if, if news breaks today and they say, well, uh, it, this happened in Jerusalem and Israel did this. You understand, the news is writing history as we go as if they're truly Israel. But God sees them not as the blood and not as their address, 
who, a true Israelite is one that believes on the Lord. We are called the Israel of God if we be according to this rule, having the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says it's blasphemy when a Japhethite that doesn't believe in Jesus says, I'm a Jew. You've actually gone against, you've contradicted the Word of God. You're in Romans 9, 6. Let's take a look at this. Romans 9, chapter 6. Not as though the Word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Israel. Now what's he saying here? He's saying the nation of Israel is not saved as this is being written. In fact, the religion of Judaism, they must convert and become Christians or they are not saved. That old covenant has gone away. There is no salvation in the old covenant without faith anyway. But, but now the new covenant is here. The old one is waxed away. It's disappeared. There is only salvation by one name, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when Romans became saved, they were called Christians. When the Greeks became saved, they were called Christians. And when the Jews became saved, they were called Christians. And that's what must take place to be the Israel of God, the Israel that will be resurrected. Uh, continuing in Romans 9, look at verse 7. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. What's he saying? He said, your flesh can't save your soul. We're only saved by faith. Look at verse 8. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted for the seed. What's he saying? The children of the promise, those that have believed that promise, they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, they are the children of God. We are the people of God. By faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, your bloodline can't save you. Your address can't save you. And if somebody says, well, hey, I'm a Jew. And you say, do you believe in Jesus? And they say, no, well, then you're not a Jew. I'm an Israelite. Do you believe in Jesus? Well, then you're not really what you claim to be. In fact, that's blasphemy. Uh, go back a few pages to Romans chapter 2. Go to Romans 2, verse 28. This is important because in the end times, we'll see Magog attacking, we'll see Magog being brought up and attacking of Israel. And the question is, who's in Israel? Well, we just saw in Ezekiel that the ones in charge of the mountains of Israel is actually the enemy. They're not the people of God. Romans chapter 2, look at verse 28. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. This is fascinating. This is important. If you would, go to Ezekiel. Go back to Ezekiel. Uh, this time, go to Ezekiel 38, if you would. Who is a Jew? One that is circumcised in the heart, that has believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And technically, you are a Jew if you're saved. But we don't go around calling ourselves Jews because it was clear in the Bible that they forsook Judaism and they became Christians. And Christian, New Covenant, New Testament church is God's chosen people. And we will resurrect at the last day with the Old Testament saints. It'll all happen at one single event. In Ezekiel, for the sake of time, there's a few things that I want to give you, but I will skip it. In Ezekiel 34, it says that he will save his flock. He will judge between cattle and cattle. He will be a shepherd over them. He says that David will be a prince over them. He says this in Ezekiel 34. He says the same thing in Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37, which, which is right before where you're at now, Ezekiel 37 is a famous passage about the resurrection. It's called the Valley of Dry Bones. And it says the whole house of Israel, they will be resurrected out of their graves and he will put muscles on them. He'll put on sinews. He'll literally bring them up out of their, their graves. He will put his spirit on them. He says he will make an everlasting covenant with them. So that's foretold in Ezekiel 34. It's fulfilled in Ezekiel 37. I say all that to kind of give you this I believe we have Ezekiel 37 is the resurrection it's the valley of dry bones it's a bunch of dead bones that come out of their grave and they're resurrected and then following that where we're at now we have Ezekiel 38 and 39 and if you've read Ezekiel you probably already know that 40 
through 48 is all during the Millennial Kingdom. The tree of life that's spoken of, the, the river of life that's spoken of in Revelation. Uh, so there's cross-references to all of that. And now I'll just give you a glimpse into these two here where we're going to learn about Magog and how the application of Magog during the wrath of God after the resurrection of the saints up to the battle of Armageddon. So you're in Ezekiel 37. I'm sorry, you're in 38 rather. Let's start in verse number 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog and the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. So Magog is like the largest of all of these brotherly tribes that are in that area. And I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth. And all thy army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia and Ethiopia and Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Now here we see some of their allies, Persia. What do we call Persia today? Somebody help me out. Saudi Arabia? Saudi Arabia? Iran. Iran. That's a little closer. Iraq, Iran. That's Persia. Now, Saudi Arabia has some ties to some of these. Ethiopia and Libya with them. All of them with shield and helmet. So this is a battle where there's multiple countries coming together. Verse 6, Gomer and all his bands to the house of Tog Togarma, of the north quarters and his bands and many people with them. Most people will associate Gomer uh, with Germany, ultimately. Again, there are several nations. Their names have changed over time and areas, cities that have changed names over time. But most people associate that with the area around Germany. Uh, Togomar, again, is associated with the north. That's what we're going to see in the context in the Bible. It describes Magog as a place that is north of Israel. It is the northernmost part. And we have in that area what we commonly call Russia. It was once known as the USSR, where it had many other areas that fell under that communist umbrella. And it's since broken up. And many of them still associate with each other and work together. Um, these generations, if we follow it through the Bible, they would have started in Turkey and then began to work their way toward Siberia. And there's many nations up there by different names that are all very closely related, and of course some of them are intermingled. So he says, uh, verse 7, Be thou prepared, and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled. Go unto thee, be thou a guard to them. After many days thou shalt be visited. In the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword, and is gathered out of many people, against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, but is brought forth of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. So where Russia, if you will, is going to go, where Magog is going to go, is Israel what this is saying. Uh, jump ahead, look at verse number 14. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, Thus saith the Lord God, in that day when my people of Israel dwelleth safely, shalt thou not know it? And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, and a great company, and a mighty army. And thou shalt come up against my people Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days, and I will bring thee against my land, that the heathen may know me when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before my eyes. Now he's saying God is going to show up in this event. He will be seen of them. He's going to say it several times in the next few verses. God is bringing them forth. God has angered them and he is drawing them in. Much like how the Lord knows how to control Nebuchadnezzar and Egypt in this event, Gog and Magog will be drawn into battle. They will come to the mountains of Israel. Uh, look ahead, look at verse number 18. It says, And it shall come to pass at the same time, when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. Now, my fury, I believe this is the time of the Lord's wrath. 
He says in verse 20, so that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all the creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence and the mountains shall be thrown down and the steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground. Now, when it's shaken, I mean, that's a, an earthquake, if you will. We'll see that in the next chapter. So there's earthquakes. The Lord's going to arrive. When God begins to pour out his fury, the wrath of the Lamb begins to happen. We know that there are vials that are poured out. There are trumpet judgments that also happen simultaneously. And the fish are affected and the land is affected and the rivers are affected and God begins to pour out his wrath on the earth and he shakes the earth terribly, it says elsewhere. Verse 21, he says, And I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. Now that's utter confusion. When everybody comes together to battle, and this has happened at times in the Old Testament, when the Lord gave them victory, the enemy started fighting against themselves because of the utter confusion when God caused an earthquake. We saw a similar story when Jonathan went out with his armor bearer and got such a great victory. It was a similar instance as this, where there was a shaking of the land, the Holy Spirit was working among them, them. They scared them to death and there was utter confusion. The enemy was attacking themselves, uh, much like in the wrath of the Lord. Verse 22, and I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood. And I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are within him and overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Again, this is the wrath of the Lord. Yeah. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself and I will be known in the eyes of of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. This is the Lord's promise. This is his threat to them. You're going to come up, and I'm going to use it as an opportunity to destroy you, to destroy many, and you will see me literally physically as I come. Continue into the next chapter, verse 39. Therefore, thou son of man, prophesy against Gog, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, I will turn thee back, but leave but the sixth part of thee, and will cause thee to come up from the northern parts, and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. So the army's coming from up north, and he says, I'm going to cut you up and, and send a sixth home. We have a similar word in English called uh, to decimate. If you decimate something, that means you destroyed nine-tenths of it. There's a, a, a tenth left, basically. That's kind of, he's saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to chop you up and kill five-sixths of your army and send just one sixth back. Verse three, and I will smite thy bow out of thy left hand and will cause thine arrows to fall out of thy right hand. Thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel. Thou and all thy bands and all the people with thee, I will give thee unto the ravenous birds of every sort and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. Now remember this verse right here because we're going to see it again in this chapter and then also in Revelation. The ravenous birds of every sort. These are bad birds that are eating flesh. He's foreshadowing what's going to happen when he destroys them all. Verse 5, Thou shalt fall upon the open field, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord, and I will send a fire upon Magog, and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles. And they shall know that I am the Lord. Jump ahead, if you would, to verse Number nine, and they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers, the bows and the arrows and the hand staves and the spears, and they shall burn them with fire seven years. There are so many weapons that are brought to Israel somewhere at this point that for the seven years going into the millennium, there's so many weapons that they're going to beat and destroy and use for wood. Now, if you know prophecy, you know that there is a time when they're called to war, when they beat their plowshares into swords, and then there's a reversal of that when they take their spears and their plowshares and they, or verse vice versa, they take their spears and their swords and turn them into farming instruments because now we'll be at peace. Now the Lord will heal the earth and you can eat your own food without being taxed or attacked or being a victim of any bad people because the Lord will be the judge over the earth. It will be an, a covenant of peace is what it calls it in uh, Ezekiel 34. Ezekiel 34 also tells us about the plant of renown, which, e which Ezekiel 47 tells us, the tree of life bearing uh, 12 manner of fruits will be the he healing of the nations. It'll be for medicine. I know I'm throwing a lot at you guys, but I want you to catch this. This is the judgment of the Lord. 
He's going to bring Magog, which does appear biblically to be Russia. He's going to bring them at Israel. Obviously, the question on everybody's mind right now is, well, does it happen here? Uh, does it happen here? Does it happen here? Does it happen here? And let me just share with you, I believe that according to the Bible, according to the scriptures, we will see this happen right here at Armageddon. I have brothers in Christ that believe otherwise. They say, well, no, it mentions Magog here. So anywhere else it says Magog, obviously that event has to be after the millennium. This is a separate event. The event that we're reading about here is called Armageddon. It's the final of God pouring out his wrath. It's after the resurrection. Chapter 37, right before this, mentions that they come alive, they come out of their graves, he puts his spirit on them, and they live forever. And then we get this, the wrath of God, Ezekiel 38. We're now in 39. There's so many weapons here. They burn them for seven years. They have a process. They employ people to come and find the bones. There's a special process to bury them. A lot of people think that some of that may be that it was nuclear weapons involved in the war near Armageddon. It's entirely possible. I don't know. If you would uh, look at verse number uh, 15. And the passengers that pass through the land, when any man's, man seeth a man's bone, then he shall set up a sign by it, till the barriers have buried it in the valley of Hamagog. Hamon Gog. Also the name of it shall be Hamanoah. Thus shall they cleanse the land. And now, son of man, thus, shalt the Lord, thus saith the Lord God, speak unto every feathered fowl. Now this is key. We're going to read a few more verses here and then go jump and take a look somewhere else. But I want you to see this. Every feathered fowl. Does this ring a bell in prophecy? All right, we're going to take a look. Uh, and to every beast of the field, assemble yourselves and come gather yourselves on every side to my sacrifice that I do sacrifice for you, even a great sacrifice upon the mountains of Israel that ye may eat flesh and drink blood. Ezekiel 39, 17 and Revelation 19, 17 are direct parallels. We're going to go there next. Uh, let's read a few more verses before we go there. Verse 18. Ye shall eat the flesh of the mighty, and drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of rams, of lambs, of goats, of bullocks, and of the fatlings of Bashan. And ye shall eat fat till ye be full, and drink blood till ye be drunken of my sacrifice, which I have sacrificed for you. Thus shall ye be filled at my table with horses and chariots, with mighty men and with all men of war, saith the Lord God. And I will set my glory among the heathen, and all the heathen shall see my judgment that I have executed in my hands that I have laid upon them. So the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day and forward. God will literally be visible in this judgment. He will show up. He will begin to take care of business. Uh, look at verse 27 before we flip. He says, When I have brought them again from the people and gathered them out of their enemies' lands and am sanctified in them in the sight of many nations. God wants everybody to see what's going to happen here. God will show us when He uh, resurrects all of the saints. If you would, go to Revelation 16, please. Go to Revelation chapter 16. We're going to finish here in Revelation. We're almost done. I appreciate your patience, and I hope this is edifying to you. So when somebody says, well, uh, what's happening now? That is the last sign, and Jesus could come at any moment. Well, not so fast, right? There are things that must happen before the return of the Lord. That would be the tribulation, in which we have the seals. We have the Antichrist revealed. A one-world government, a one-world religion, the mark of the beast. These things will take place. Now, there are some other verses I could point you to, and I won't tonight, that lead me to have a theory that there may be a war of some sort in here. I do think that's possible, but it's not clear. There may be a war that then gives us an event to set up this man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, who opposeth himself and exalteth himself above all that is called God. So these things will happen before the Lord returns all the way up to the fifth seal when it's clear the mark of the beast. Christians will lose their head. We'll be persecuted for our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And listen, what an awesome opportunity. We last forever, not here. This body is not your home. We're just passing through. 
One day you will be resurrected with the Lord and you will have your eternal body. That body somehow will reflect your rewards from Christ, from your service and obedience and your soul winning and your reading and your discipling and your ministering to others and uh, helping people with the things that you do for the Lord here will be rewarded at this moment when you're resurrected. We have something to look forward to. Now, we do come back to the earth and rule and reign with him for 1,000 years. And in the meantime, he will pour out his wrath up to this final culmination of an event called Armageddon. You're in Revelation 16, which, if you notice, is a parallel to Revelation 8 through 11, as God is pouring out all of this wrath on the earth. I won't read it all, but look at verse 1. It says, And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways, pour out the vials of the wrath, of God upon the earth. Here it comes. God's pouring it out. And we're not appointed unto wrath, but we are appointed unto affliction and tribulation. Uh, that is God's plan and persecution as well. Now jump ahead to verse 16. Revelation 16, 16. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake, and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came into remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And again, I believe that Babylon is end times Jerusalem, the earthly Jerusalem, where every wall will fall over. And the mountains will be brought low. Verse 20, And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, and men blaspheme God because of the plague of hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. This is God's judgment, his wrath. The next couple chapters, he shows that uh, great whore, mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. I believe that to be that earthly Jerusalem. Let's skip that for now, go to Revelation 19, and we'll finish in Revelation 19, 17. That is what I told you, that Revelation 19, 17 is a direct parallel to Ezekiel 39, 17. So let's start right there. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying unto all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken with him and the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that they had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. So we have Jesus showing up in a sword, on a horse with a sword, and he's coming to battle. They come against him right here, and this is the major culmination. The important part about this for us to understand. You are saved. You cannot take the mark of the beast. There are false prophets like John MacArthur that says, oh, a saved person can take the mark of the beast and then repent and then get saved again. That's because he doesn't believe in eternal security. That's because he is pre-trib, by the way. His, his eschatology is wrong. He wrote his own Bible called the, the, the uh, Legacy uh, uh, Study Bible, I think it is. The, I mean, his name has been blotted out. There is no place for his name in the book of life. John MacArthur is a heretic. He is a reprobate. He's teaching bad doctrine. Just take the mark of the beast. It will be okay. The majority of his listeners, they watch TV. They drink alcohol. They get divorced and remarried as often as they change clothes. They live however they want to live. And here's the problem. Here's the warning. We are surrounded by people that want to live however they want to live. They have addictions in the flesh. They have desires, they're covetous, and they give in to them. And when the mark of the beast becomes necessary 
to continue their covetous lifestyle. Although they may give God lip service and say, I would never turn on God and I believe in Jesus. There is a great falling away coming where those that are not really sealed unto the day of redemption, they've not trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ alone for salvation. They're looking at their works and they're proud of their works and they love their life. These people will, I believe, fall away. Yeah. It's just like a drug addict. It's just like a drug addict. If you, Somebody that is addicted to a certain drug, they will fight and then they give up and then they give in and then they win a battle and then they go back to that drug. Why are there so many homeless people that in a lot of ways are choosing to live in the woods or under a bridge? And listen, I'm not being cruel. There are so many programs in every city that will, they will house you, they will clothe you, they will feed you, they will train you so long as you can stay clean. There are even programs to help you to get clean. There are even those that get arrested and go to jail for years and then as soon as they get out, they go right back to the drugs. And here's the problem, the human flesh. We preach Christ crucified. We want to pull them out of the fire. We have to understand that we have the one solution. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Once you're saved, your eyes are open, you have spiritual awareness. When the mark of the beast becomes present, and it is a decision, all I have to do is say that that man is God, and worship the dragon, and take this mark in my hand, or in my forehead, and then I can have all the money I want, they'll cancel out my debt, they'll give me free health care, I get free food, all I have to do is submit to the devil. A Christian, you can't do that. You won't be able to. You may have a desire for food, that's an addiction. <laughs> You're cutting out sugar. God bless you. <laughs> And pray for this man. He's cutting out sugar for three weeks. That's hard to do. Now, for someone that claims to be a Christian, that's lived their whole life covetous and greedy of money, and judging God's prosperity on their life by how valuable their treasures are, how many houses they have full of things, a garage full of things, and cars that they don't even need. Listen, this is going to be a big deal in the end times. When we get, when we get here, the Christians are gone, but, but as all of this begins to progress, there's going to be points here where we have opportunities to get them saved and help them see the truth and not take the mark of the beast. You're in Revelation 20. I want to, I want to read it again, if you would. Read verse 20. 20, 20. And the beast was taken with him, and the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image... Do you understand? This is the same thing Revelation 13 says. To receive the mark of the beast, you have to worship an image of the beast, of the dragon. This is the future. This will happen. It's our job to wake people up. I want you to understand there are people that may be conservative or politically aligned with you, and if they bring up Magog, they may be confused as to where it's happening. And I want you to know what the Bible says, but bigger than that, I want you to tell them what the Bible says and help them to see the truth and make sure that they're saved. Don't just receive it and believe it because they're talking conservative political talking points. Make sure that they're truly believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. This is our job while there's still time. We persuade men. Knowing the terror, terror of the Lord, therefore we persuade men. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the word. Lord, thank you for giving us warning of what will happen. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be strong and use the time wisely that we have. Lord, whether or not we're so close that there's no time, Lord, help us to just live like every day matters only for you. Lord, I pray that you would give us the wisdom and the fearlessness, the boldness to be able to witness to our coworkers, our friends, and our family. Lord, I pray that with grace you would help us to tell those that we love, to tell them when they're lost and that they need to trust you. Lord, I thank you that salvation is a free gift. Lord, I thank you that once we're saved, we can't lose our salvation. Lord, I just pray that you would give us the wisdom to speak the truth for your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.